Okay, this class is called Trinitarianism. People use different terms. If you were to um, be someplace, they just call it God, Christ, and Holy Spirit, uh, which is okay too. We've tended to use the theological terminology. That's why we use the word bibliology, Trinitarianism. We could call it theology proper, Christology and pneumatology, which would also be okay. Remember the word for theology is from two Greek words, theos and logos, which means study of God. And so the reason why sometimes they say theology proper, because since all of it's a study of God, when you're talking about salvation, man's sin, salvation, or as last things, eschatology, you try to think, well, what are you about when you're studying God himself? Well, they call it theology proper. But the term we've used is Trinitarianism, which refers to the fact that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We will discuss in what way that is so. And so, uh, if you wanted to divide it down, though, we could have theology, proper Christology, and pneumatology. All right? Now, um, the textbook for the course, or several, and I will be giving you a more complete syllabus next week. But for tonight, for our purposes, uh, we will be using the Cook book, W. Robert Cook's book on the Christian faith. Theology, systematic theology in outline form. Be uh, using, continuing on using the charts of Christian theology and doctrine, which you already have, right? Everybody has that. The book that uh, that is sort of used in all the theology courses. Uh, the charts book I did. If I have a copy up here, I can show you a break. You need to see it. Uh, we'll be using that one because it has a lot of areas that deal with theology, proper Christology, and pneumatology. Uh, moreover, since we're dealing with the doctrine of God, I've also uh, put down two books for you to, to be knowledgeable with. And that is the one called The Battle for God that was done by Norm Geisler and myself. You may want to know how it comes about that his name is first and mine is second. It's, you could be alphabet except we flipped for it and he won. So, uh, <laughs> How what can I say? If I had just gotten the heads instead of the tails, uh, it would have been my name. Yes, tails? I, I don't know what it was. That's it's why you lost. Was. I, I, I flipped, we flipped the coin and he won. So <laughs> the battle for God, and then also the charts book I have on called Open Theism and Orthodoxy. Charts Open Theism and Orthodoxy. Now the reason why I've, I've uh, had you get these other two books are for, for two reasons. One is because uh, uh, since I wrote the books, you ought to have them. And secondly, because this is a pivotal question today. I mean, uh, not too many in evangelical circles are debating the doctrine of the Trinity. They're not debating whether Christ is God as such, or the Holy Spirit is a person. Some of these kind of controversies that we continue with historically in the church are not really at the forefront of the debate right now. Uh, what is at the debate is the attributes of God. Because there is a movement on, uh, even within evangelical circles. It's been broader than evangelicalism and what was one time uh, talked about and called process theism, which is still present today, but not many people uh, have been attracted to process theism. But evangelicals have bought into a variant of process theism that's called open theism, and I think it's extremely important that you be knowledgeable in this area because this is a subject that you will encounter probably in the ministry. Uh, since you have prominent evangelicals who have bought into this view, then that, that is a problem. Secondly, or thirdly, even if you're not into open theism, uh, nonetheless, among evangelicals, there have been many to abandon the classic view of God. The view that was that's been held by the church for almost 2,000 years, the view that was articulated by Thomas Aquinas in his famous work, uh, Summa Theologica, you know his work, and has been held by by theologians of the Reformation since the you know 16th century until just a few years ago. Uh, the views of God. Uh, you will find evangelicals today who would not say that they are open theists who nonetheless would reject, reject God's simplicity, or they would reject his impassibility, or his immutability, or his eternality. And many of the attributes that we find that are historically understood by the church as being part of God's, what God is, his nature, 
uh, even among those who aren't out and out open theists, have abandoned certain aspects of that. For example, if you turn to Wayne Grudem's uh, very popular work on systematic theology, he makes a point of saying that he uh, does not accept the doctrine of impassibility. Well, Clark Pennock, who is an open theist, says he believes that uh, impassibility is a fundamental doctrine. You reject that, why, why even keep the rest? And so he's abandoned most all of uh, the classic views of God. Or, or I have other friends who rejected the doctrine of immutability. Uh, they believe God must be changing in some way. And, and so we're going to look at these attributes, and I think it's important that we really get ourselves grounded in the classic understanding because among, among us are those that have rejected that. Well, anyway, uh, going on down to uh, course text again, uh, the Lagos Scholars Library is a part of the required curriculum, and uh, you should get that. You'll find it very helpful also. Uh, how many have that? The Lagos? One? You want to be sure to look at that, because we get a half price. We get 50% off through the seminary, and it's very important for biblical studies today. And that's uh, Different than or added to Moronics? Well, Lagos and Moronics. Same, same thing. Same thing. Fantastic. Okay, so you've got. Well, I have. I should have raised my hand. Okay, all right. I'm on its way. Okay, you have it on its way. The only two, we only two people lacking, and they will repent soon. Yes. <laughs> so uh, we'll move right on. Um, course objectives. Cognitive deals with the mental objectives, obviously. The student will be able to differentiate between various views on the biblical doctrines covered in the class. This is a generic uh, syllabus tonight. What we're talking about here is Trinitarianism, the doctrines of God, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Cedar will contrast clear logical thinking with logical fallacies, often using arguments regarding theological subjects covered in the class. And uh, we uh, expect students to work logically. Now, I, I wish that we had a course sometimes offered right about the same time we offer hermeneutics as an introductory course, of course, in logic. Because it's not uncommon at all to hear people make arguments that do not follow logical processes. And we want to try to force ourselves to do that. Uh, three, student will compare various viewpoints on key passages relating to doctrines covered in the class to be able to state their strengths and weaknesses. Now, one approach that I like us to do is that you cannot deal with every single passage on any given doctrine. Uh, it just takes a long time if you were to do that. But we want to deal with the pivotal passages, the, the, the major passages. Uh, for example, if you're dealing with the issue of servanthood, the major passages are John 13 and you feed, uh, Philippians chapter 2, if not the entire book of Philippians. And that gives you a, a pretty good concept of servanthood. Uh, although there are many passages that mention the word servant. So what you do is you study the major passages and then you look at other passages as, as they relate, refine, and uh, tune up you know, the given, given uh, the major passage. <clears throat> now, effective learning is emotional in nature. She will gain a greater appreciation for the personal words of God. In my view, if you go through theology and you're, if, and, and you don't become more worshipful than you've missed the purpose. Uh, we're not just studying this so that we'll have knowledge in our head. I think you have to start with knowledge in your head, but you study it so that you think right, so that then you feel right, and then ultimately you do right. And all those three are important in theology. I think I had my greatest spiritual growth studying theology. Uh, some people say that, well, theology is boring. It's only boring if, uh, if you're out of tune. Uh, to, to know more about God is not a boring subject. And you better get familiar with it because you'll have to do this forever. Uh, for eternity, we learn more and more about God who's infinite. So uh, effective learning and greater appreciation, and you'll develop a greater conviction concerning the importance of the study of theology. I don't find theology as something that is sort of optional. It's a required thing. To be a Christian is to, uh, if you're growing as a Christian, you, you grow in your conviction about theology itself. And so, uh, anyway, effective learning. Now, behavioral means that 
deals with the will. So we've got the intellect, we've got the emotion, and last of all, we have the will. By the way, I, I've, the way I've taught not only this course but other courses is the fact I think all of our learning as Christians should follow that, that uh, procedure. The intellect, the emotion, and the will. And in and, and that order, that order is extremely important. It should not start with the will or the emotions. It must start with the mind, go to the heart, and work into the will. So the student will demonstrate knowledge of the doctrines of the Bible covered in the class. How are you going to do that? By an exam or two. The student will present carefully reasoned written work, which demonstrates an understanding of the major doctrines covered in the class. That will be a paper due. The student will explain various arguments pro and con of the doctrines covered in the class. So these are things you will actually act out. Now, some of you from last quarter are wondering about an exam. Never fear, it's coming. And uh, it will not be too bad. Uh, so, but I'll talk to you about that later. Now, course requirements. The student will read the textbooks. Which textbooks are those? Battle for God. Okay, Battle for God, Charge of Theism, and the Cookbook. Those will be the three primary texts. This uh, charts of Christian theology and doctrine. No, just just irrelevant. Uh, you don't have that yet, Jeff? No. Okay. Well, we'll talk to you about Carl that. Carl didn't tell me about that when I haven't got my books. Okay. Okay. That, we have some down there, so. Cool. We'll see. Yeah, you'll, you'll be okay. Um, now, uh, you read the textbooks. Student will take exams over reading and lectures. And there'll be at least two, I'll give you. The student will complete a doctrinal paper. That's, uh, you know, 10 or 12 page paper on a doctrinal issue which we'll cover in class. Uh, we'll ex I'll expect you to write it in such a way that you have uh, correct footnoting. Uh, let me just mention to you that you can use Turabian as your basic source I mean, style, form, if you like, or you could use Chicago. But you also should look at the uh, SBL style book. SBL style book is a standard style book for theology. Society of Biblical Literature. And uh, you should be familiar with that. Now, if you're working in Lagos, Lebronics, uh, you can actually set up a style sheet if you'll look in there and, and pay attention. You can go in and actually tell it what style form you want to use, and it will actually help you on that. And if you're not familiar with that, I'll show you how to do it. Uh, the only other thing as far as course requirements which are not written there is that you will also be expected to read collateral reading of 500 pages. Now the reason for that is to familiarize you with other theologies, uh, theologies besides Cook or, or what I have. And, and that could be anything from John Wesley's works to Martin Luther's works to Calvin to uh, Grudem or Erickson or many others, uh, Miley, Wiley, various, uh, you know, or different persuasions. It's, it's good to be exposed to, to others. And this is just, just reading, no, no exam or anything, just, just broad reading. Try to pick out some different uh, systems. I mean, you know, uh, John Miley is the best, probably best Arminian scholar of the 19th century. Uh, John Wiley is a, uh, is a uh, Wesleyan Arminian scholar of the 20th. Uh, of course, Augustus H. Strong, which by the way just came out in Lagos. Uh, Strong is, is, uh, uh, is a late 19th century Baptist theologian, unfortunately losing his way as he moved toward the end of the century. In certain areas, his views of atonement are off, his views of creation are off, and some other things. But uh, nonetheless, he was the one I was required to read all the way through seminary. Um, you can go to, uh, of course, Hodge. Charles Hodge is always a standard Presbyterian scholar of Princeton Seminary fame, uh, middle to the latter portion of the 19th century. Uh, people like um, uh, Shedd and Rabin. And uh, my goodness, so, so many of the scholars for some reason have names with a B. Yeah. Uh, Especially the ones in Van Hooser that. Lots of B's. Yeah. Uh, of course, the liberal scholars, more liberal, Bart, yeah. Brunner, Brunner yeah. Bonhoeffer, 
Bar, oh, excuse me, Boltzmann, uh, uh, and others. But then you also have uh, those uh, like uh, uh, Babbing, who's a, 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 a reform scholar, Burkhauer, um, and others. So anyway, you can go through and, and find those. Yes? I was just wondering if uh, Charnock and uh, Edersheim would be accepted. Yeah, so this kind of thing, yeah, you should read some of Charnock. I'd encourage you to read Charnock. Stephen Charnock's Existence and Attributes of God would be very pertinent. In other words, when I ask you to read this collateral reading, it's reading that relates to the Course. So, since we're dealing with God, Christ, and Holy Spirit, obviously Charnock would be good. Uh, another book called Knowing God by uh, J.I. Packer, a non-B theologian. What's a non-B? The grade will consist of two exams, a paper, and the collateral reading. Okay? That's pretty simple. Any questions? Would Tozer be okay too? Uh, yeah, I read a little Tozer, but not much. And the reason why is because Tozer is, I hate, I know this sounds, but it's too easy to read. For, you know, you're in a graduate theology course, and Tozer is much more of a layman oriented, you know. Kind uh, of Max Lucado, he's pretty deep. Lucado <laughs> would be for high school level. Yeah. If you're in high, if you're doing the high school program, then you can do Max Lucado. Um, I, 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 I don't know. I guess I didn't think that Tozer was any easier than Packer. Any easier than Packer? I, I think Tozer is is certainly a uh, a helpful thinker, but he's not a he's not of the, uh, the kind of theological depth that you find in someone like a Hodge or a right. stronger. Uh, Packer is again written much more for a popular audience too, so it's still probably not at the same level. You'll find out when you read Charnock that that's deeper thinking. And it's, it's good to have to interact with people that are much more, uh, uh, much more erudite in, in some of the thoughts, okay? Since we're graduate theology. Okay. Anything else? Having just gotten off the plane, well, for some reason my ears are still not quite on top, so I, I don't know if I'm allowed it anymore. <clears throat> now, uh, what we want to do is move into the discussion of the existence of God. Does God exist? Uh, I suspect among us, none of us are arguing or wondering about that point deeply. We've probably settled that one already. But there may be some people you come across that have not, and so we will uh, we'll tackle this question of the existence of God. Uh, first of all, in dealing with the arguments of the existence of God, there's two, uh, two areas to discuss initially. And, and the first is revelation versus rational argument. Uh, how do you come to know God exists? We're going to look at some arguments that are rational arguments. One is called the cosmological, the teleological, the sometimes called anthropological or moral argument. You have the ontological argument and you have others. And uh, we will examine those here in a moment. Uh, various arguments, but there, there's a bottom line question on how you even, uh, how, how, can you, uh, how can you amass facts about God uh, without him revealing them. That is, God is self-revealed. He's self-disclosed. And that's the first thing we'll look at here in a moment. Uh, the second issue is receptivity. In other words, you can have the best arguments in the world if people are not willing to be receptive to the arguments. Uh, the sun can be shining very brightly, and yet if you're blind, you won't see it. And so there are two problems. Uh, that, that we deal with. One is the question of revelation or coming to know God. And secondly, uh, even if God revealed himself so plainly that uh, you know, it's bright like the sun, and I think he has, uh, who will receive him? Or why do people receive God? Those are issues that we have to get to. Now, we'll not get into the second issue here, receptivity, as thoroughly right now. We'll deal with that in the third course of theology, which is the course of man, sin, and salvation. Uh, when we deal with the nature of man, defective nature that we have as sinners and what goes into that, questions of the will, 
questions of the Imago Day, the image of God, man, some of those issues. You just can't deal with them. I mean, theology tends to interconnect, and no matter what you start talking about, you talk about other areas of theology. Uh, but you have focuses that you have, and right now we'll deal primarily with the first. Now, the knowledge of God comes through two forms. So one is natural revelation, the second is special revelation. And uh, our first study will be primarily natural revelation. We'll look at some things here. Special revelation we really dealt with in the uh, first course of theology when we dealt with bibliology. And so we won't rehearse all of that here. We'll just touch on it. Our, our study now is more concerned with the question of natural revelation. Now, we will obviously deal with special revelation when we deal with the text. Anytime you open the Bible, you've already made a statement that this is something that, that provides information and authority uh, in regarding God. But uh, natural revelation is given to all and intended for all. Whereas special revelation is given to few, though intended for all. That is, it is such that, special revelation is such that a person uh, is capable of understanding the truth, uh, even if only a few receive it. Natural revelation, on the other hand, is obviously from the word nature, natura, natural. Uh, we sometimes use the word general revelation. You have... You have uh, specific revelation, which is scripture, or in certain instances of the development of revelation could be God talking directly to Moses. But specific information about God is spoken in words in contrast to general revelation, which is not spoken with words, but in a very figurative sense. In other words, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> when you see a bird fly in the air, that's general revelation, so to speak. You know, when you see the sun come up in the morning or the earth go around to catch it, uh, that's general revelation. So general versus specific, natural versus special terminology. Uh, sufficient for condemnation. Now, a lot of people have wrongly read uh, Gen uh, Romans chapter 2. They've read Romans 1 that says that uh, though they knew God, they did not honor him as God, nor were they thankful. But what did they do? They made them themselves idols, things to worship, even to the point of creeping things in the ground or birds or, or even human beings, which obviously the Greeks did. And uh, you, you have a, a revelation, but the question is how do people respond to it? And that's part of our discussion, and that is when you look at Romans chapter 1, Romans 1 does not speak of redemption. It does not speak of justification. It doesn't speak of what we sometimes call Salvation. Romans 1 speaks to the fact that human beings, when approached with the revelation of God, are not responsive. As a matter of fact, they, they move the other direction. They become uh, darkened, not enlightened. That's the natural condition of human beings. It would do us at least to read the passage. For it says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, it's important to see what that says there. I mean, the words are deliberate. I don't think the apostle just puts words here. Uh, it's deliberate. Truth, which is rational in nature. What did I say truth is one time before? Truth is that which conforms to reality, yes. The, the, the state of how things really are. Who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Notice that truth, a rational thing, is suppressed by a moral thing, unrighteousness. Which seems to say that the difficulty is not comprehension or cognition. The difficulty is a spiritual moral problem. Uh, and the term for suppress here in the Greek is a word which means to to push down, to hold down. It means to uh, put your foot on the trap door somebody's trying to get up and you're standing on it. Uh, truth is trying to get out of the basement, so to speak, and you're suppressing the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them. 
for God has shown it to them. Which is to say, and I used to read this wrongly, because I held a view of apologetics which basically said that uh, you don't try to use rational and evidential arguments, you know, you, uh, you just uh, you operate purely with special revelations. And, and, I, and now I'm much more of an evidentialist. But if you look at the passage, it says God has shown it to them. That is, the truth isn't hidden. The truth is obvious. And even those people that have rejected the truth of God see the truth of God, know the truth of God. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, which is in italics, but in the Greek it's just the, the invisible things of Him, His invisible things, are clearly seen. Not obscurely seen, but clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful. I'll just stop there a second. I mean, the passage seems to say again and again and again, if I'm reading it correctly, that human beings, even those who do not embrace the truth of Christ and are not believers today, are not going to heaven, even though they have this condition in their heart, they are able to see things adequate about God to make them without excuse. They can't claim later, I didn't know. Because the text says they did know. And they say, well, it wasn't clear. I mean, it was too ambiguous for me to grab hold of it. And the text says, no, it's clearly seen. So whatever excuse a person wants to make before God in eternity, it will be inadequate as far as God's concerned because He's made it plain. Now, true, this is not the gospel. But I am convinced if a person truly were to respond to this, then, then they would be able to move on to another stage. But what is the response of people even to natural revelation? The response is rejection. So, so are, you, are you suggesting that someone could be saved apart from the gospel? I am not suggesting that. I am not suggesting they could be condemned. They can be condemned. As a matter of fact, they are condemned. Already. They are. Already. Every person stands condemned. It's only when one receives the gospel that one moves. There is no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. So only upon reception of gospel, good news, is there a lack of condemnation. Until then, you're condemned. And you're without excuse. And you're justly so. And you have nothing to, to offer as, as a reason why not. It says, they knew, not God, they knew God, but they didn't glorify Him as God. And I like this statement. See, they did not glorify Him glorify Him as God, nor were thankful. That's a condition of human beings. I'm always amazed everybody keeps saying, God bless America, God bless America. America needs to bless God. Not God bless America. I mean, we're always saying, God bless us. Why doesn't America bless God? That is, be thankful. That's, that's where we need to come out. Uh, but notice what happens, they became futile in their thoughts. Notice the progression here. Thoughts, mind, and their foolish hearts were darkened, which deals with their affective aspects. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and even creeping things like insects and bugs and such. But you find religions uh, throughout the world, you find religions that worship insects and, and frogs and, and all sorts of things that uh, that's certainly degrading to the, the being of God. Therefore, Conclusion, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. I, I think that's interesting. It's not just for a lie, it's for the lie. 
and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. What a statement. Uh, what a predicament for human beings, but uh, what an indictment. The truth of God is that we are in His image, and God is, uh, but God is is dwelling in a light unapproachable. That God is a Creator, an eternal being. He's infinite. All those things that we know about God, His infinite attributes, to be somehow degraded and and, and uh, minimized down to finite creatures is a lie. And as a matter of fact, is the lie. Uh, that God is not that way at all. Because God should not be made a creature. He's creator. And because they have done this to God, then it goes on to say, for this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Now, a lot of people do not like this statement uh, in our day. But uh, I, I, I remember a recent judge, you heard it in the last couple of days, mm -hmm. a recent judge said there's no rational reason why women and men cannot marry each other. Men, men, women, women. And I'm thinking, the guy has got to be crazy. I can think of a lot of rational reasons. Um, but when you have debased your arguments to the point, when you rejected God, uh, you cease to be thankful to God, you begin to see God as a creature, uh, when you begin to... Um, give yourself over to these kinds of things, then it's not surprising where it goes. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness and sexual morality and wickedness and covetousness and maliciousness and full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness, their whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, bolsters, inventors of evil things, disobedient parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Mm. Uh, this is a state of mankind. This is a state of humanity. We see all these kinds of sins among us. And what they are, are manifestations of having been turned over by God because humans have rejected God. In other words, if Adam and Eve had stayed straight, if they had not got involved in sin, and their progeny had not continued their practices, none of this would be. But because they turned their back on God, it, becomes, it, it begins to be a spiral. A spiral. Because uh, sin is not such that you just sort of dabble a little bit. And, and then you sort of say, well, you know, we made a mistake or two and we'll keep it on the high road. Sin tends to become more and more and more and more debasing. The more society turns away from righteousness, it, uh, it just has no place to end. It's sort of like the whole idea of the Holocaust. You know, once they kill off the Jews, they'd be looking for somebody else. Because there never comes a place at which you're ever, there's, there's an insatiability. There, there's never a satisfaction when you start judging people in certain ways. And there's never satisfaction in sin. When you reject God, then there's no stopping place. And I, that's the thing is about hell. Whatever you may think about hell, apparently part of the whole problem of hell is the fact that uh, it just gets worse. Never better. Sin has a way of eating things up. Now, that's a view of God. Sufficient for condemnation. John, uh, excuse me, Romans chapter 2 does not speak again 
does not speak of salvation. It speaks of God's judgment. The fact is that even people who do not have the law of Moses written on stone and in the book, the book of the covenant and the stone of um, even people who have the law of Moses uh, don't do any better because they're sinners. Now, I'm not going to deal too much more with sin because that's again on God, man, sin, and salvation. We're going to look at a lot of stuff on sin and the nature of man and so forth. But I think it's important for us to understand at this juncture that God has given sufficient evidence. The problem is not the evidence. The problem is the lack of receptivity on the part of the person uh, who, who is to believe in God. And when we get to soteriology later on, we'll talk about how it happens that people that are sinners and rejectors of God, how does it ever happen that they come to God? And we'll discuss that, but not now. Yes? Um, just on what you were saying earlier about how we're getting worse and worse, so are we saying that, uh, that, uh, sin, that there will be sin in hell? Will there be sin in hell? Uh -huh. That's all there will be, basically. Okay. Sin. Sinners and sin. Okay. See, it's amazing. Look in the book of Revelation. It's, it's fascinating to me to see this, but it's so, it, it's so uh, uh, picturesque of, of this that when God brings judgment upon the earth, it said that they... Uh, not that they repented, but they basically, you know, just rocks fall on us and hide us from the wrath of the, uh, of the Lamb. They don't respond in, in asking forgiveness. They basically respond in, 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 in putting up their hands and cursing God. The response of human beings to God's judgment is to curse, is to rebel, is to be and, and uh, just continuing to sin. I mean, sin gets worse. Not better. So, like that, that's even going to be true in the resurrection then? Or? For whom? For, for un sinners? Yeah, for unbelievers. Yes, for unbelievers, they don't get better. Okay. I, just, I didn't know if uh, that was something that God would put up with for eternity. You know? Well, he, uh, he lets them continue on in their sin. Yes. Okay. Do you Hell, have any verses see, on that remember, God, God is in, in, in the. In the, uh, in the I'm trying to think, you know, in the whorehouses, if I can use that term, I know we have more polite terms, you know, houses of prostitution or, or what's the other term? Brothel. A brothel, yeah. But whether it be a whorehouse or whether it be a, a, a bar or whatever, whatever it may be, God's there. Did you know that? God's everywhere. He's in the worst places. Yeah. I think God is in hell. But not in the same sense. I mean, you have to have God in hell because hell is a place, and God, if He's omnipresent, He's everywhere. But He's not in He's not in hell in the same way He is in the midst of His people in worship. See, uh, when God was with Moses on the on the holy mount on Sinai, or when God was in the temple in the Shekinah glory, He's there, but He's there in a different sense than He is, let's say, in the in the dredges of society where he's being rejected. He's everywhere. He's just there in a different sense. I, uh, the ability to have a fellowship with God is part of the, the, the condemnation of hell. The one that has been spurned for one's life, uh, you don't come into association with in hell. You, you have the emptiness of not having an association. And uh, so, Sufficient for condemnation. Natural revelation declares God's greatness. The heavens declare the glory of God. Right? Uh, we, we find that, uh, you know, a psalm like Psalm 19 or even a portion of Psalm 119 and so forth have this, have this idea of the greatness of God in nature. And so um, it, it, it declares who He is. Now, where do you find natural revelation? You find it in nature. You find it in history, like with Israel. You find it in the human moral consciousness. There is that sense which uh, 
like St. Augustine said once, you know, that our hearts are basically are basically empty. Eternity is in our hearts, and we don't have rest until we find rest in you. And so the restlessness is part of the condemnation of one who rejects God. But uh, God is revealed in human moral consciousness and man's religious nature. I mean, people, even who do not come to the truth of God, not that they don't know the truth of God. We've already declared they know the truth of God. But people who do not embrace the truth of God uh, yet know God and they uh, have a religious nature. But they fill that religious nature with falsity and not truth. Uh, people can be extremely religious. There are people who do some strange things. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of these things. I know I... Uh, People, you know, hanging themselves from hooks and, yeah. and stuff like that, trying to, you know, I don't know how you do that. I mean, hanging yourself from hooks, you know, a bunch of hooks all over your body and just sort of hang, trying to somehow pacify a god. Or people that, that climb up hundreds of stairs on with bare need till they just bleed, trying to somehow pacify some angry deity. The ascetics did that. Hmm? The, even Christian ascetics did that. Yeah, yeah, you have some Christians who have a wrong understanding of God's uh, mercy and grace who have even gotten involved. Somehow they're participating yeah. in the passions of Christ. Now you can find a, a, passage, a passage of Scripture that seems to say something like that, that uh, talking in Colossians about the fact that participants in the sufferings of Christ. But I don't think that that's talking about that we do something in order to receive God's grace so we don't do something to receive God's favor of any sort. You know, it's... God is not moved by us trying to do that. He's, uh, he's moved by our, our uh, response to His grace. But, yeah, you have Christians who do strange things. I can't say whether they're Christians in the sense of genuine Christians or not. I don't know. But the people that even do crucifixions, you've seen that? You know, they, they, around Easter time, some South American countries or Latin America, you know, they'll... they'll They'll have themselves nailed to a cross to, to participate in Christ's sufferings with this misunderstanding of, of, of what we're getting at there. But, <coughs> but natural revelation, the fact is people uh, have an inclination to be religious in nature, but that doesn't mean that they come to truth, embrace truth. Religions all over the world. By the way, uh, uh, it's amazing to me that you have people that want to, who are willing to actually, and they would only do this in religion. Every area of their life, you know, they try to act logical. But in religion, you can be stupid. You know, you can believe that all religions are equally true, even if they're diametrically opposed to each other in their thinking. Only in religion. Say, so, well, I have a, do you have a hundred dollars in the bank or a thousand? Either one, they're both they're both the same. No, they're not. A hundred dollars and a thousand dollars is different. And business is important. You know, is a light green or red? Should you cross or not cross? It doesn't matter. Either one's okay. Cars coming or not, just jump out there, you know. Uh, it's only religion where people think that, that there's really no truth, is what they really believe. There's not truth. Um, <clears throat> okay, now. Knowledge of God. There are seven basic worldviews. <coughs> this came out of Norm Geisler in uh, Bill Watkins' book called uh, Worlds Apart, I believe is what the name of it was, on worldviews. It's also found in my charts book on theology. But if you look at this with me, there's a sense of ultimate reality. What is real? What is true and real? What is ultimately true and real over against that which is limited? And uh, there's three possibilities, and only three. There's a possibility, at least in a, as we're articulating views that might be argued, atheism. Quite honestly, I don't think one can truly be an atheist. <clears throat> I think you'd be an agnostic. But I don't believe anybody can truly be an atheist. I've always had fun on the radio when I've done radio talk shows in the past. I used to do those and be on every day, you know, and, and 
have people call in. And I, I always enjoyed atheists calling in because they would say, an atheist, and I would agree. And I said, you can't be an atheist. And they said, what do you mean I can't be an atheist? I said, it's not possible to be an atheist. You can be an agnostic, a skeptic, but you can't be an atheist. Why well, don't I want to be an atheist, you know? I said, if you're an atheist, first of all, to know there is no God, to know there is no God means that you have to be everywhere. Because if not, there may be a God somewhere you're not. And to know there's not a God, then you would have to know all things. For you would have to know adequately to know there is not a God. When there, If you don't have all knowledge, then there may be a, a, some knowledge about a God, a true God, that you don't know. So you have to be all-knowing, you have to be all-present. In other words, you have to have the attributes of deity to yourself, and then you can't argue there's no God because then you'd be God. So uh, it's not possible to be an atheist. Now, the other view is that there's one God. That's the one I hold to. <clears throat> Another view is there are many gods. Polytheism. Uh, theism, as you know, means God. Just like A is no God. A, theism, no God. Polytheism. Poly means many, many gods. Uh, which is a very popular view. Uh, there are many religions in the world, ancient religions particularly, but even in uh, modern times, certain Hindu religions, African religions, Mormonism. Uh, Mormon religions, yeah, who are polytheists. Uh, when you argue polytheism, I put down here for sake of completeness, infinite, no view. Why is that, do you think? <clears throat> Why do I truly exclude being an infinite view being within the field of polytheism? Why would there be multiple infinites? You cannot have but one infinite. This is a view that I, I dealt with a, a Mormon lady one time who actually ended up uh, converting and becoming a Christian. But I challenged her with the view that you cannot have multiple deities who are infinite. You can have millions upon and billions of finite deities but you can't have but one infinite being. And the God of the Bible is infinite, not finite. <clears throat> so if you have a polytheistic view in Mormonism where you have many gods, then ultimately you have a view that uh, cannot be the God of the Bible discussed at all because he's an infinite deity. Uh, but you can have many, many, many finite deities. Okay, now. If you hold the one God view, which is the other view I would hold, then you come down, you have two options. Either the God is finite or the God is infinite, one of the two. You theoretically could have a finite deity of some sort. But that finite deity then would have to coexist with reality outside himself. In other words, uh, uh, you could have a deity who is uh, uh, creator of the universe as we know it. He would have to coexist with the universe. Because you realize if you have a universe, then you have time and space. If you have a deity who creates time and space, then that deity then would be spaceless and timeless. If he's spaceless and timeless, that is, he has no limitation as to time and space, there are other things that are also true in reference to his nature. The concepts of simplicity, issues of omnipresence, and so forth. You cannot, uh, you have difficulty having a finite deity if, unless you have a deity that's coexistent with the time and space universe. So you can't be the creator of all. But a finite or infinite. Well, let's go to finite first of all. Finite, you have one view is called panentheism. Now, panentheism is different from pantheism. Uh, these are Greek terms. Theism means God. Pan means all. And means in. I know that it's a funny place where Greek and English get together. But God is in all in that sense. Um, so in this particular view, panentheism is sometimes known uh, by the term, at least the view called process theism is panentheistic. The fact that the universe is, is God's body, so to speak. Like, like we have a spirit that is inside our body. God is the spirit, so to speak, of the, of the, of the world's body. 
So the world's a body in which God dwells. But he's limited as this being. He is a growing being, learning being, evolving being. In panentheism, God is in an evolutionary form. Uh, the universe is larger than God. Yes. I just, I don't know, I just, that, I, it just seems curious that uh, you have pan pantheism under infinite and you have panentheism under and finite. finite. For sure. Yeah, that's I would think it would be the other way around. It's not. Not if you understand what they are yet. Okay. We'll try to go through them and maybe we'll catch it. Okay. Because I, uh, I, I guess I just understand maybe I, the panentheism is that God is more than the world, but that the world well, is God, in God. Well, God is other than the world. Right. The other than the world. Pantheism, God and the world are the same. Panentheism, God and the world are different. So how is that? How is if God and the world are the same? Do they say the world is infinite? I mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, let me get over here in a minute. I, uh, I, I don't want to get to that. Let me let me explain this one first. Okay. Panentheism says that the world is the body of God. God dwells in the world, and uh, God is in all. So. God works in the world, and, and as the world changes, God, it, the world, there's a symbiotic relationship between God and the world. The world changes God, God changes the world. He's, he's in relationship with the world. And by the world, we mean all that exists other than God. So God and the world are the two realities. And we believe that's true also, don't we? God, of course, before the world, there was only God. And then when he created the world, there's God and the world. And now those are the only two realities, God and the world, creator and creation, that's it. So in this is the same view, I mean, that's all. But God is in the world growing and developing and knowing and learning and becoming better and becoming more. But the world is also going through process. This is process theism. God is God and the world are going through process. It's an evolutionary view of God. If you want to get right down to it, this is probably closer to where a Mormon concept is in some respects. <clears throat> now, then you have, and, and the reason I say this is because Mormonism actually is view of God's evolutionary nature. You study the, study the theology. Another view is a view that would have been held by the Greeks. Uh, not all Greeks. And you'll see in a minute that some Greeks held to pantheism. Uh, it's, not a, you know, it's not a uniform. Just like in Hinduism, Hinduism has finite Godism and it also has Pantheism. There are, there are branches of Hindu thought that are pantheistic and others that are really in the finite Godism. So the Greeks are the same way. But uh, let's say God is not identified with the world. Uh, he is separate from the world and he is a powerful being. Uh, but there is not this... Uh, in, in finite godism, basically, you actually have the gods coming out of the cosmos. The cosmos precedes the deities. It's what they call cosmogony, the birth of the gods. Uh, from ganao, which means to give birth to, and uh, in cosmos, you know. So you have cosmogony, or a more specific term is theogony. The birth of the gods, Theos and, and Ganon, to be birthed in. So both terms are used. But uh, in many of the ideas of Jupiter and, and our, you know, Zeus in Greek or Aphrodite and, and Artemis and all these various gods, according to the use of Latin and Greek terms, uh, these gods really sort of come out of the world. The world precedes them. And, and it's a nature religion. In, in ancient Greek thought. That's also true of some groups today. A finite Godism would be true of uh, certain, certain forms of African religion. Uh, now, infinite, if you, let's say we reject this one, let's move to infinite. Uh, two possibilities. One is that God is identified with the world, and the second is that God is not identified with the world. I mean, those two options. And when you, um, when you look at pantheism to explain that, pantheism means all is God, or God is all, so that the world and God are identified. That is, when you look at the world, you're looking at God. When you're looking at God, you're looking at the world. There is no distinction between the world and God. It's the same thing. Different terms. Different emphasis. It's the same thing. 
And that's why we say the world is infinite. Uh, people who argue for panthe pantheism argue that, that all reality, that's why I say infinite, all reality is one. All reality is God. All reality is the world. There is nothing outside the world. There's nothing beyond the world. There's no transcendence. There's only imminence. Would that necessarily make it infinite, though? Yes, as it is. That's, that's how the term would be used. Unlimited. That is, uh, it means that there's no reality other than the world. Well, I guess I just don't understand how that's infinite, because it could have an end. It just, there is well, they don't think there is an end. Okay. They don't think there is an end. So, like, the universe would extend forever? Forever and ever. Okay. There is no, there is no, matter of fact, they would argue there's no beginning and there's no ending. Okay. A, a person who understands pantheism does not believe there ever was a beginning to the universe. It's always been. And there's never an ending to the universe. It always will be. Okay. And, and, and that is God and God is it. Yeah, that's exactly true. I mean, you should okay. Well, yeah, that makes sense. That, I mean, I guess I just didn't catch that you were saying that, that they believe that the universe was, you know, eternal and... Yeah, they and, do. They believe there never was a beginning and never will be ending. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's standard pantheistic views. And this is true in, uh, in, uh, in Buddhism, which is non-personal. You're right, Buddhism as a religion uh, is, uh, has a non-personal deity. That is, they really don't believe in a god as a being they use the term, if they use the term God, they will use it in a very obscure, abstract sense. There's no being God who hears and listens and knows or acts or, it, it, it's, it's, uh, there's a sense of consciousness, but that consciousness is a universal consciousness, but it's not a, it's not a consciousness in which there's true interaction of minds. It's a strange view. Uh, I have a book coming out on world religions, if you want to read on this stuff, there's a lot on it. <laughs> and, uh, and Buddhism came out of Hinduism. Uh, Buddha, the Buddha, uh, went down to India after he abandoned his family, and kids and wife and everybody, and never, never saw him again. He just left them and went off to learn. And uh, went down to India and he picked up his ideas, and of course began to spread them, but uh, that is one view. God is identified with the world. The other view is that God is not identified with the world. What, what is meant by that is the fact that you can see a difference between God and the world. You look at the world as one thing, you look at God as another thing. I mean, and of course, if you believe that God precedes the world, that God is eternal, the world is not, then God is over the world and different from the world. And uh, that's what we mean by not identified with. That is, you can distinguish the two. And in that comes two views, and that is one is called deism, and the other is called theism. Uh, deism means that uh, it's very close to theism in many ways. Uh, deism says that, that God and the world are different. God preceded the world. God created the world. There was no world that God created. But when, he, when God created, he was etern he's eternal. He pre-existed, you know, he's no bad material being. He's, a, he's God very much like in biblical views in some respects. He creates the world and then he essentially leaves the world. And that's the key of deism, that he's an absentee God. He, he created the world just like in theism. Deists and theists in the first century, you know, uh, during the period of the Enlightenment, held very similar views in this regard. Uh, and, and reference to creation, they were very close. But theists believe that God is, continues in the world. What we know is creatio continuo. You know, deists and, deist and, and, and theists believe in creatio ex nihilo. You know, creation out of nothing. But deists and theists separated on creatio continuo. That is, the theist says that God continues to work in the world. And that's a big distinction that occurs. I mean, there are other issues too, but. Because obviously the ramifications, if you believe God works in the world, then you believe God reveals himself in the world, God lets himself be known through scripture, and God saves. And I mean, there's a lot of implications coming from which way you go here, but not in reference to creation. Yes? Um, so deism, that was that same idea of God as clockmaker, right? Yeah. 
Or well, it that? could be. So the clockmaker argument is one that came out with uh, uh, a guy whose name I know very well. Not Ockham. Um, mm. The guy's name, I know it so well. And it will come to me in a few minutes and I'll think on it. But no, the guy who argued the clockmaker view was a theist. But it is true that deists, many would accept a clockmaker view. That is, they share a commonality in reference to the idea of God as a creator and transcendent. But a deist doesn't hold much to God as, as in an eminent sense, that is, within the world. Cannot believe it, cannot think of the guy's name. Maybe it comes to me later. Okay. <clears throat> Now, in reference to agnosticism, there's two forms of agnosticism. Is it open? Uh, it should be open. What time is it now? Let's see it's first time. Because we really do. Jesus, eight. Very good. So how, how much time do you have on that? That's, that's important for me. 31 minutes. 30 minutes. Okay, so we'll take a break in about 30 minutes. Okay, uh, agnosticism, you have soft skepticism and hard skepticism. A soft skeptic says this, I don't know whether there's a God or not. I don't know. A hard skeptic says, no one can know. God is unknowable. So there's quite a difference between a person saying, I don't know whether there's a God, and saying, God is not knowable. And so we have two different views of, uh, of skeptics between those who are called Agnostics. Now, agnostics from two Greek words again. Gnosis, which means to know. The alpha primitive at the beginning, like with atheists, means not. So not to know is an agnostic. <clears throat> All right. Now, in reference to the creation of the world, there are only three options that I know of. I, I don't think there are any others, and none that I can come up with. Uh, either the world created itself, in some way it was actually involved in its own creation, or it just somehow happened out of chance, as some people use the term. Or there is a creator. It just so happened we don't have any explanation for it. Just it's here. When you get right down to it, these two move very close together. Because even when you argue it just happened by chance, I don't understand how, uh, you still have to deal with the issue of causation. And we'll see how that works in a minute. Now, the impossibility of self-creation. It's not possible for the universe to create itself. It's a violation of the law of non-contradiction. It would both have to be and not be at the same time and in the same relationship. Now, the three laws of logic, what are they? The law of Identity, A is A, a thing is what it is. Two, the law of the excluded middle, which says is A is either A or B, oh, excuse me, something is either A or B, can't be, you know, it has to be one or the other, it has to be that way. And the third law of logic, and these are in volatile and universally held laws, there's no example of them not being true. Uh, the third one is called the law of non-contradiction. Two things cannot be opposites and yet be true at the same time in the same way. Two opposites cannot both be accurate at the same time and, and in the same way. For example, uh, I can say uh, you're here and you're not here. You're here in body but not in mind. See, two things 
Can I, if I say you're here and you're not here, those are opposites. But are they opposites in the same way at the same time? For example, I can say I'm here in body and mind, and that we can leave here and I cannot be here. Right? At a different time. I can both be here and not here at a different time, or I can be here and not here in a different way, but I cannot be both here and not here in the same way at the same time. That's a law of non-contradiction. Always holds true. Always holds true. So, the universe cannot create itself because it would be a violation of the law of non-contradiction. It would both be and not be simultaneously in the same way. Now, secondly, chance. Chance creating the universe. You ever heard people say, with enough time and chance, anything can happen? You heard that one? A thousand monkeys on a thousand typewriters. Yeah, if you put a, if you put a thousand monkeys on a thousand typewriters, Giving them enough time and chance so they can write to the works of Shakespeare or something like that. And that's, that's nonsensical. That simply cannot happen. Quite honestly, they'll be lucky on a thousand monkeys on a thousand typewriters to type out the word, you know, if they were going to type out the origin of species, they'd be lucky to get the word origin. So, uh, time and chance don't do anything. Time is a way that we measure motion in relationship to objects. It's a measurement is what time is. And space is a relationship of objects to each other. That's what space is. It's a thing, but it's not, it doesn't do anything. It's measurement. Chance is a word that we use when we do not know how to explain the way certain things happen. But chance is not a causal reality. Uh, I don't have a coin. Anybody have a, a coin? Yeah. Just a short, you know, nickel, dime, quarter, thousand dollar bill. Okay. Uh, okay, now. See, we would use the word chance because we're using gambling and so forth. And there's what is known as probability theory and all this kind of stuff. I mean, maybe it's, I've studied it in, in college and you probably did too. But uh, if, I, if, I, if I do that, it came out tails. Now, if I do it again, it came out tails again. That's two out of two. Do it again, it came out tails again. That's three out of three. Do it again, it came out tails again. That's four out of four. Do it again. Came out tails again. That's five out of five. You're joking. You're like so. Five no, I'm dead serious. Every time it's been tails. <laughs> well, then I can't believe it. Except for that book. I, said, I don't know how. <laughs> New York must have been flipping the coin there. <laughs> he was. He did flip the coin. Now that I think about it. Uh, and I don't know what happened this time. Heads. Tails again. No. That's well, six. If you can make it to ten, I'll buy you whatever we're getting there. Six. Tails, that's seven. <laughs> that's seven. <laughs> Eight? No way. This is a... Okay, <laughs> he checks to seven. <laughs> Heads. 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 Uh, so you now, me. <laughs> now, let me say something. There is a read. See, we could say it, it just so happened, or it was by chance, that eight of my nine tosses was tails. But see, chance is not anything. Chance is an abstraction. Chance doesn't do a thing. Nothing happens by chance. Chance is a word that we use when we don't know the reason why it happens the way it happens. See, the reason why this thing turned the way it did and it came up the way it did has to do with a lot of factors. How I held it in my hand, what, re what resistance I have in the air, what energy I put into it, what force I put behind it when I do it, angle, so many factors are there why certain things happen the way they happen. If you can actually duplicate, replicate in, in exact proportion, in every way, 
and act. It would occur the same way every time from now on for 100,000 years. If you could reproduce it identical. Let me speak to so good. See, it's, there's no chance involved there in that sense. Chance is just a term I use. Here's this back. Tails. There's a, a one and Tails. a... Tails. Tails. <laughs> There's, there's a one and a 256 <coughs> chances. There's what? It's, a, it's one in 256 times. Of what? Of uh, flipping the coin eight times, you hit tails every time. Tails, one out of 256? Yeah, that's pretty cool. You know, do you know what the whole thing about probability is that the probability is not each time. Right. It's the one time. A lot of people think, well, my, my, my uh, uh, chances, my chances increase if I do it more. And each time it's the same. It's the same. Yeah. yeah. So, uh. I want to do every time. Approximately 50%, give or take. <laughs> so, the point I'm making here is that when people talk about time and chance having any impact on creation, something doesn't. Chance has nothing to do with it, it's a term we use. Now, Quine is formulating what is known as the cosmological argument. Two Greek words again, the study of the cosmos. Cosmos is the word which means order. So the study of order, uh, theoretically, I mean, I mean, that's essentially what the word means. But cosmological, as you'll see, uh, is ultimately, as we use the term, relates to the issue of cause and effect. And you'll find another term we use, teleological, relates to design and oftentimes the issue of how things are, are, are organized. So cosmological is the term we use for the study of cause and effect. Every effect has a cause. Don't let people mistake this to you. It's not that everything must have a cause. Every effect must have a cause. The difference between everything and every effect. Every effect must in fact have a cause for that effect. There cannot be an infinite regress of finite causes. Understand what I'm saying with that? If you will look at this, you cannot have a cause and an effect that is... See, look at me here. You have a cause which brings an effect, and that effect cause is a cause of the next effect, which is in fact a cause of the next effect. You cannot have an infinite regress of cause and effect. Infinite means unlimited. Okay? Anything that actually has a beginning in a cause and effect relationship must eventually have an ending. You can have an infinite regress of these things. Think about also the concept of energy. In a physical world, every cause that has an effect, which has a cause which has an effect, eventually loses energy. Think about it. You ever seen that happen? Mm -hmm. For example, you spin a top. Why? It, Eventually, it goes down. Why? Because the you don't have constant input, right? You'd have to have a constant input for forever to make the thing continue. Every. Um, but isn't there like because of air resistance? Like I'm sorry. Isn't that because of air resistance in space? If you did that, would it keep going? In other words, if you were in outer space and you spin a top, would it, would it just continue on forever and ever and ever? Right. Is that what you're saying? Right. Mm -hmm. um, there's enough pressure. There's a certain there's a certain amount of energy. There's a certain amount of energy you put into a spin. And unless you could argue that 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 the energy put in is infinite in nature. Well, but an object in motion stays in motion unless something acts upon it to change that fact. That's just a. And I mean, on the that's on a lot Earth, of we have a lot of it. Like air resistance and friction. Well, yeah, you have air resistance. If you have some kind of resistance, true in outer space, even right. mm -hmm. and you because you have other things working on it. For example, uh, light, right. gravity, such things. But uh, but you cannot have a, a ongoing infinite regress of things happening. Yeah. If you have a if you have a beginning, which has to be a cause. The cause ultimately has to be uncaused. Has to be uncaused, yes. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're moving to. Uh, there must be an uncaused cause or a necessary being. 
You cannot have finite cause, and that's the key. You cannot have finite cause. You ultimately have to have an infinite cause. Plus, well, like the Mormons talking about uh, infinite regression of gods, and that doesn't work out for them yeah. either. Yeah. yeah. Now, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz said, the first question we should rightly be asked is, why is there something rather than nothing? Uh, you have to explain why is it here? That's the most irrefutable argument, I think. I, I think. I mean, there's a lot of them that are just, I mean, logically are like, the, like the, the numbers that you have to, like, if chance is what created life and that sort of thing from uh, yeah, natural I mean, circumstances, that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, almost absurd, but. Well, but, it's hard to explain how you can have anything at all in the universe, right, with the right combinations occurring. What's, what's so strange in reference to the primordial soup, as it were, this mass in reference to life in the earth, is how you can have the, a combination that occurs by all these uh, chemicals and, and gases and so forth being present and receiving a charge from something that would cause them to, to uh, somehow move from inanimate to animate. You have to explain how that occurs. Mm -hmm. And even if you knew that, you'd have to explain out how these things, once being created, could even continue their existence in the hostile conditions mm -hmm. in which they would have even come into existence. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's a lot of problems. Right. There's a book called The Mystery of Life's Origins by Charles Staxton and Walter Bradley. If you want to read on this, it's a very technical work. Uh, these are a couple of friends of mine. Uh, uh, Charles Staxton's a biochemist. Bradley is a uh, is a, uh, a professor. Actually, he may uh, cease being a professor. I see. Uh, it's he a mystery is retired of life. now from Texas A&M. Mystery of life. The mystery of life's origins, and it's all about the whole problem of the creation of the first life. How do you come to even the first life moving to existence? And the the difficulty of coming from life to what we have right now, from the initial life to what we have right now in full-blown human beings walking around and animals and so forth. This is less difficult to understand and accept than the initial life coming to existence at first. It's more problematic to begin first life than it is to even move from first life to where we are. But it's, it's even more problematic to begin first anything than it is for to begin sure. to believe, you know. You have to explain, and again, that brings us back to our question. Uh, why is there something rather than nothing? Now, everything that does not have a cause, every effect must have a cause. The solution of the riddle in, of life in space and time lies outside of space and time, according to Wittgenstein. Consequently, the solution of why there is something rather than nothing is not discovered by looking at the something, but what is beyond the something. This deals with then the second law of thermodynamics you're familiar with, sometimes called entropy, to the terms. Mm -hmm. The second law stands the concept that the universe is running down, and the reasonable inference from this concept it must have had a beginning. Uh, this is not by Leon Morris, it is by Henry Morris. You made that statement, and you're familiar with Henry Morris, probably. Uh, Creation Research Institute, but he's not the only one that says this. The thing is, if, if the earth has a beginning, uh, how far out can that beginning be? Because it's running down, is a problem. And my purpose here is not to get into issues on, you know, young earth, old earth, and you know, young, young universe, and all this kind of thing. The point of it is the universe could not, cannot be infinite. Why? Because it has to start somewhere. It has to start somewhere. Well, if it were infinite, and we know its rate of, 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 uh, of uh, 
digression. We, we know it's, it's, it's rate of decay. If it were so supposedly infinite, it wouldn't exist. In other words, if it never had a beginning. If it never had a beginning, as some have argued, there's a view called the steady state view of the universe, that is, the universe never had a beginning. But if it never had a beginning and it has a decay, it would already be in existence. Forever ago. Forever ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Literally. The absence of an essential being or uncaused cause often leads to self creation or chance creation, both of which are logically impossible. That is, the universe cannot bring itself into existence because if it brought itself into existence and it would already exist, it would not need to bring itself into existence. A circle or chain of causes would require a link in the chain to be causing existence and having its existence caused simultaneously. Potential reality producing actuality, this is not possible. Nothing cannot cause something. And that's the problem. Nothing cannot cause something. Well, that's like, how did they even get to the idea of the primordial soup or whatever? I mean, like, well, this, how this, did that even come about? Well, they don't have any evidence for it. It just must be. Because if you don't have it, how do you explain the life beginning? You have to explain something. No, but how do you something. explain that beginning? Well, you know, it's just there, you know. What, you don't. That's the question. Quit asking questions. Quit asking questions. <laughs> question. But that is a problem. How do you explain anything? How do you explain the Big Bang, as it were? Yeah. I mean, as people want to argue that now, then not everybody agrees with the Big Bang view. Well, let's say you accept the Big Bang view. That is the fact that, that all matter in the universe at once time existed. Uh, so dense that it occupied a, a, a period on a page. That's the density of the universe. That is like it's the size of a, of, a, of a period on a page. It was so so infinitely dense that it, 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 it gradually it heated to the point that it exploded, and thus we have everything we have, including us. Uh, you yeah, have a lot of faith here somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, where did all that stuff come from? Where all the, the you had to explain where that dense period came from. Mm -hmm. yeah. God wanted to pay attention. Plus, I, I think I actually, I, and I, you know, maybe I just don't understand it all, but I think I've actually figured out something that um, when I when I was taking you figured out what I was I figured out something when I was taking my uh, astronomy class at at uh, in college. Mm -hmm. um, why the Big Bang theory just it can't work. Because, okay, apparently they they figure out how far or how long the universe has been around based on how many light years away we can see. Okay, um, astronomers I'm talking about. And uh, okay, so when we look back, so we, so when we look that far away though, we are looking back that far in time. Okay, now in order for us to be able to see that far away. Um, and that is how long the universe has existed, then we would have had to travel faster than the speed of light to get there, and what, what we would be seeing would be a single explosion, not stars and that and all that sort of There's a lot of problems. So it's just, it, it, it just you, doesn't follow. Yeah, let's put the Earth here. And let's put... Uh, we don't know where. Well, let's let's put the the edge of. Uh, let, 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 let's, let me know you do this different. This is the this is the big bang. This is a big bang, right? So it shoots out at what kind of speed? What's that? See, this this is the big bang. This is boom. Okay, that shoots out at what kind of speed is what you're getting at. The point right. is, if I am here somewhere in the universe. And I'm looking at something that maybe is uh, uh, 50 trillion miles away. Mm -hmm. How long would it take for matter from here to reach, let's say, 50 to 100 trillion miles away? Moving at what velocity would it, would it have to be occurring at for it to actually be out there to be emitting the light that I observe mm -hmm. 50 trillion miles from me? 
How did, how did, it, could that occur in 15 billion years? I doubt it. I doubt if, if you can have, argue that something out here is 15 billion years old when it exists such that it, let's say, uh, uh, you know, a light, uh, a light travels 186,000 uh, miles a second. And a light year is how far a light travels at that 186,000 miles a second, which is pretty phenomenal. Oh, yeah. And then say something is a, is a, is a hundred thousand light years from me or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the extent of it is, but the, you seem to be 15 year, 15 billion years seems to be too, too young. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's exactly because we, they say we can, we can see 15 billion light years away, you know, 15 so, billion light years. Right. That's what they say. And so, but the universe is, to, is, is a lot younger than that. Well, yeah, of course, but but that's from our perspective, you know. No, that's from anybody's perspective. Uh, scholars today, scientists, don't they argue? And I think mm -hmm. I, I think we're in agreement. Mm -hmm. Scientists say that the Earth is about, or the universe is maybe 15 billion years, 20 billion years old. Mm -hmm. Billion, not trillion. Well, that's why I said I, I thought I meant to say yeah. billion. If I said trillion, I didn't mean to say that. No, you did. You said you said billion. Okay. Yeah. The universe being 15 billion. Years old, we can see. He it said, "He said they say that we can see 15 billion light years, and that's how they know the age of the universe." But it would have had to already get there, you know. But, but I, I and we can see that far in every I mean, direction. So. Here, they don't say that the that the universe is 15 billion light years. They Year, say years 15 old. billion years. Years old, and that's but and we can see that far because light has had that much time to travel. But it would have had to leave there already 15 billion years ago. Yeah, but, you know, it's, but it's, it's, far, just, it's farther it than that fall. time, though. Can we come back to this? You can drive a truck through those logical <laughs> holes, is all I'm trying to say. Yeah, it would be a butt. All right. Now, huh? You want to say something else? No, no, I'm just saying I didn't want you to be mean, but yeah. this, is, I'm, this is so far from my head, I'm not even grasping what you guys are talking right. about with your billions and trillions. So. Well, what we're saying here is that the fact is that you have uh, a question of infinite cause and effect. What we're discussing here this year of time is infinite infinite time. Do you have infinite time? No. Because if the universe is, let's say, 15 billion years old, and yet I'm observing something that is several trillion or a hundred trillion miles away, that's that's more time than available. For the supposed 15 billion years, that you couldn't have it. I know. I agree that the, the the Big Bang theory. That's what we're talking. The Big Bang theory may not have what's going on. And then you have a view of the steady state view of the universe, which is where the universe is eternal, and it, it, it contracts and it expands, and it contracts and it expands, and it's been doing this for eternity. But see, then you have to argue that something just is in existence without any something that is of a material nature. Uh, is eternal, and you have you have to explain the formation of, 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 uh, of molecules of atoms. And where do they come from in the first place to even start off this beginning? But see, usually what happens in any kind of any kind of situation where you have ex contraction, expansion, you're using energy. It's just like you take a basketball and you drop a basketball; it will go down and hit the ground. It will pop back up a ways, and it will go down and it, and you leave it there. Eventually, it'll be sitting on the floor because it has to have a constant from somewhere else than its own world, so to speak. It has to have an input of energy. Somebody has to come along and bounce it again. So you have to explain that the universe is going back and forth and back and forth. Something outside the universe, not within it, has to be bouncing it again, so to speak, or it would be just stopped. If it were eternal, it would have stopped long ago. So it's never had a beginning. So these are all views that really have problems uh, other than a theistic view. The law of causality applies only to finite beings. God, who is infinite and eternally self-existent, does not require a cause. See, uh, only effects require causes, not things. God is an infinite being, does not require a cause for himself. He is, in fact, first cause. There's now, the teleological argument is another argument. 
We're going to take a break after I finish the uh, discussion here of the um, arguments of the existence of God. The teleological argument is an argument of design that cannot be attributed to the object itself. Okay? This observable order argues for an intelligent being who has established the order. This being is God. So here we have what is, we're going to get into in a few minutes that some of you are familiar with called were you here when uh, Jay Richards was here? Did you go to the, to the uh, lectureship uh, and Phil Johnson? You know, mm -hmm. okay. um, this view is where we end up calling the intelligent design argument. The splendor of the universe has supreme coherence from the very small... Where are we? One minute. One minute left. Huh? Good time. Well, this would be probably a good time for us to just take a break. Come back and deal with 